Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see y'all here, even those that you had to hobble in. <laughs> so Thank you. thankful that Lori had successful procedure done on Wednesday. She did. So, wow. Can you believe it's going to be 60 degrees outside again today? Yay. <laughs> I, I, just, I just think of this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Yes. We do have some things that are coming up here. We still have to set a date for our next movie, which will be in May. So that's, we got to get going on now. That I know we're excited about it. We want to get it going. Um, got some to choose from, so we're it's kind of like you know, we got to be like go to the Old Testament maybe and cast some lots and try to figure out which one we want to do. <laughs> That's going to be coming up. Orange Track Racing is coming up on the 10th of April. And uh, between now and Orange Track, I can't believe we're saying this already. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. So we are two weeks from Easter. But we got a lot coming up. We got some things happening on. Uh, Holy Week, uh, Easter Week, so please uh, check out our website, check out our Facebooks, Instagrams, um, and uh, YouTube, Twitter, whatever you're on. Go ahead and get out there and check those out, that's where they'll be. And yes, last week I said the website was down, this week it is back. We had it up pretty quickly. Um, our host did a wonderful job working with us to get everything done. And fortunately, we did not lose any of our our important files or emails either so we are very thankful for that so with that uh, let's go ahead and uh, just thank father we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us we can look outside father and see the sun shining and we know that maybe because we can't quite see the sun but we can see shadows and shadows indicate the sun is out and we know that the sun is in here with us father fill us with your holy spirit as we hear your word. This morning's call to worship is, comes from James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. And I was, and in this, it says, uh, you know, it talks about being blown. I was blown away just reading this and preparing from this once Mark, when Mark sent me this earlier this week for our call to worship this morning. And listen to what James has to say. He says, if you need wisdom, Ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is, in, is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable. And everything they do. Now, as I read that, the very first thing that I was drawn to, the very first thing I thought of, took me all the way back to Second Chronicles and King Solomon. And this is also recorded in First Kings three. But in Second Chronicles one, God appears to Solomon and says, "What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you." And Solomon's response was, "Give me wisdom and knowledge to lead them properly. For who could possibly govern this great people of ours?" What? I mean, he's asking for wisdom. He already has wisdom based on what he just said there. But God said to Solomon, because your greatest desire is to help your people, and you did not ask for wealth, riches, fame, or even the death of your enemies for a long life, but rather you ask for wisdom and knowledge to properly govern my people, I will give you the wisdom and knowledge you requested. And then he goes on to tell him that he will give him the, the wealth and the riches and the fames and that other kings had asked for but that he didn't ask for. It reminds me of the story that Mark told here and when he was talking about um, the three uh, men coming in and, and they invited love in and that love is what brought everything else in. So this is biblical wisdom. It's knowing and understanding godliness and what it means to uh, seek God. And it's, done, it's what we do to please God. Can you imagine... God would not have been pleased with Solomon if he'd asked for riches or wealth or fame. But he was pleased with him because he asked for wisdom. And it's this wisdom 
that, that gets us through things. Because it, remember, it says, do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. If, if you look at the ocean and at the waters, you see those waves. And trust me, we were on a cruise, or actually two, and the waves, when you're looking up from you know 12 decks high, they don't look very big. But when you get right down there, when you get close to it, those waves are huge. <clears throat> and, and that's what our life can be like when we don't have wisdom and, and when we're struggling with that confusion that Mark's going to be talking about today and how we can overcome it with wisdom. And if we are divided between God and the world, like it says here, then what better way for Satan to come in to seek, kill, and destroy, which is exactly what we see in the world right now. And it's, it's getting worse. It really, truly is. So we need this message this morning on how we can overcome confu uh, confusion with wisdom that Mark's going to be bringing to us this morning. I, I previewed it. <laughs> when I'm done. I didn't read it thoroughly. I, I skimmed through it because I thought it's so much better to hear it that first time. But I wanted to, to be able to speak to it a little bit better this morning and, and how he's going to bring that to us. And he, uh, well, I better not because I'll, I'll start talking about some of the things that I saw. So, Father God, we pray a blessing over Pastor Mark. We pray that the words that you have given him come into our hearts and it, it helps our hearts heal the things that have been bothering us. It helps us to heal, Father. And then it comes into our minds, Father, and it helps us to take that division between the world and you and, and, and just, just get rid of what the world keeps trying to draw us to, Father, and that we seek you in all that we do so that we can have this wisdom to overcome the confusion. Father, thank you for what we are about to hear. Again, we pray a blessing over Mark and the words that you've given him. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, when I was writing this this week, it was it was kind of fun because I was sitting up at the hospital and I'm watching the board and Lori's in surgery and then I'm really getting into it. I'm really writing a lot of stuff and then my pager goes off. So I got to quit, shut my laptop down, shut everything up, put it all back in my bag, walk in there just for them to tell me she's done. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> And so then finally the doctor came in and, and he had to get cleaned up after the surgery. And so he came in and talked to me and showed me pictures and all these kind of things. And it was really good news, you know, and, and a lot of times you, you watch a lot of people and they're waiting in the hospital and they don't really know what to expect. And they, they don't know if it's going to be good news or if it's going to be bad news. And so they, they fret and they worry a lot and, and, uh, you know, there was an older gentleman that was there, and he was really, really concerned and confused, and his wife was in getting surgery, and she had uh, kidney stones, which they had never experienced before. Trust me, if you never have, you never want to, because they're horrible. Uh, but he was so, so confused on what to do and, and, and how to handle things, and so his pager went off, and. You know, he, he got really shook and he left and well he left his cell phone and he left all this stuff sitting out there in the waiting room. So, you know, I said, Well, you know, his cell phone went off and it happened to be his daughter trying to get a hold of him. And so I walked past his room on the way back to get my good news. And, you know, he was sitting there and I mean he was just wringing his hands and everything and and so I knew he was just having a hard time. I said, Well, sir, you you did leave your cell phone out there in the chair, and the nurse was in there, and she goes, well, I'll go get that for you, and he was just, just frittering away, and I said, you know, just have peace with this, you got great doctors, they're in control, the doctor that your wife is having was my doctor, which is Dr. Bindrup, so he was operating on her, I said, he took care of my dad, took care of me, I said, he does a great job, he's got nothing to worry about, and he just goes, you know, and 
And so sometimes we need that assurance, that, that word of, of just hope to, to help us through the, the bad times or the bad situations, or what could be a bad time and a bad situation. So today's special that, that we have is, is number five in our series of six, and it's overcoming confusion with wisdom. And so number six, we're going to have to forestall because we have Palm Sunday next week, Easter the week after that. So we're going to wrap up the Sunday after Easter with the next uh, in line here, number six. But in our world today, we're, we're just absolutely inundated with fake news and opinions that are stated as facts and facts that are being skewed to underscore a certain point of view. And the list is endless and it goes on and on and on. And it's no wonder that we can be confused as to what the truth is and what is real versus what we're being presented with. And in the 1980s and 1990s, we were uh, introduced to a new political term that was out there, and it was called spin doctrine. And the way it works is that, you know, they take something out here and they take a fragment of truth, and then they kind of spin it to make it fit their personal agendas or their point of views, and then they present it to everyone as fact. And it may not quite be fact, or they just use a little bit of truth in behind it and then spin the rest of it into what supports their point of view. And so therefore, you know, it becomes kind of blurry in, in what, be, what is actually the truth and what is actually real versus what we're being presented with. And that point of view, we may or may not support, and the truth may or may, may not support what we're being presented with. And so the fact is, is they, they would hire these people to spin the truth and spin the facts to lean per people a certain way to support their agenda. And this is very, very much prevalent in our political scene today that we have. The problem is, when the truth gets skewed, it can have grave consequences. So my big question that I have for you today is, who are you looking for, for truth? Whose wisdom are you actually leaning towards, or are you leaning upon in order to get the correct information? Are you looking for the wisdom of the guy that's on television or radio, or who writes that newspaper article, are you looking to that wisdom to base what you want to do with your life, or are you looking for the wisdom of God that is based in the truth that will carry you through these bad situations? So one of the things we need to do is we need to guard ourselves with that helmet of wisdom that God provides us with, and that means we're going to have to fact check just about everything you hear in. And it's pretty sad because I know when I was growing up as a kid, there was journalistic integrity. And, you know, they did fact checking and, and they checked everything out before they printed it or presented it. And now it doesn't quite work that way. So I think probably one of the problems was in the advent of the 24 7 news channels and those kind of things, there, is you can only tell so many things that happen during the day. And the rest of it, well, it becomes opinion. And it may kind of get skewed a little bit, or, gee, I really like what this guy's saying over here. And the way you can really fact check that is, if you notice and you hop from channel to channel to channel to channel, or from station to station on the radio, you notice that they're all saying the same terms on every one of the stations. Which means they're really not checking the facts out and doing the homework themselves. They're trying to pick up something that someone else said, and hopefully they did their job, and they checked the facts, and so they're going to present themselves with a, an opinionated view of what the truth really may be. So what we have to do is we have to look for those nuggets of truth against the falsehoods that we're presented with each and every day. And that's why the scriptures tell us that we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Don't believe everything you see and hear, but believe everything by the Word of God. And the truth of God's Word and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to stumble them as we get spun and confused. We lean upon the wisdom of God, and we don't lean upon the 
wisdom of the world. Jeremiah 5, 26 and 28 says, For wicked men are found among my people. They lurk, lurk like foul. Hmm, I knew I was going to do that. Foul lurks, which is not a term we typically use anymore. But they lurk like followers, lying in wait. They set a trap and they catch men. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They've grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds of deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. Now, if I hadn't butchered it so bad, you probably would have got more meaning out of it. So let me reread this. For wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like fowlers, lying in wait. They set a trap and they catch men like a cage full of birds. Their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they become great and rich and they have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. That's much better. But what does that sound to you like? What image does that draw in your mind? Who could they be talking about in today's age? Especially when they talk about houses out here, plural. Yeah. Sounds like the politicians of today, doesn't it? Yes. It really does. They're no longer concerned with their constituents and what's important to us and what we have to deal with. They're concerned about what their agendas might be in bringing forth their agendas that keep them in power. Follow the power, follow the money, you'll know what they're after. So if you may want to think about that, and who may pop in your mind when you think about that verse in Jeremiah. So it shows us also that things really haven't changed all that much in the last 2,300 written. And this passage it paints a very vivid picture, image of the kinds of people that lay in wait for those who are unprepared. Those who are uninformed and those have no faith to guide them along their way in life. See, if you don't have that basis in faith, they lack that basis. They, they lack the wisdom to know and discern what the truth really is. And so then they become easily swayed and they become confused as the facts that they are really existing in the world today. So those facts just kind of become blurred at that point in time. So they come, become very confused because they don't have that basis of faith. They don't know the truth in God's word. And so they're easily swayed in one way or another. I said in my sermon two weeks ago that if we prepare ourselves properly, we can easily see through the guises to the truth. And this underscores why it's important to build our base of knowledge, to gain wisdom through study and with our fellow believers. We are our own support chain in here. Our, our group of believers, our church that we have, will help us through. If we're confused about things, Lean upon those around us as well, because if we are truly based in faith and if we are truly based in the Word of God, then we will help each other through these situations to see and discern what the truth is as it pertains to our lives today. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to face this alone, and we need to be able to fellowship together to get us through the falsehoods that would look to trap us. And this is why we need that fellowship of believers. And we talk about that communion of believers and being in church and lifting each other up and edifying each other. So I want to tell you, uh, this week I met with a, uh, a friend who used to be a youth leader here in a church in Cedar Rapids. And he had grown the youth group to a very, very large youth group. And he had kids from churches and areas all around coming into this youth group. Now the church itself used to be a very vibrant and alive church, but over the years they kind of uh, they kind of <clears throat> withdrew into themselves. And they became that oh country club type thing instead of reaching out to God's people. So what he was doing with that youth group was really really turning that around. And 
the kids were really being fed. They were coming from all different schools and all over the area to attend the youth, youth group, and things were going really, really well for them. And then this new pastor came into the church. And he wasn't happy with the fact that a lot of the parents of these youth weren't attending his church. And so he wanted to make a rule that said, well, unless these kids' parents attend our church, then they can't attend our youth group. Well, you can imagine what the effect was of that, right? Well, first off, my friend was very, very upset, and he took it to the staff parish relations board and everything, and, and they agreed with him that this pastor just kind of pushed and pushed and pushed until he got his way, and they finally knuckled under, and that caused a real issue because then he felt totally betrayed by the church, by the people who were supposed to be supporting him in that church body. And so he ended up leaving the church. The youth group ended up collapsing and going away, and he felt burned and betrayed and by the pastor, ultimately by the church. And the problem was, is that he hasn't attended church now he or his wife or their kids in seven years. Now, during that seven year period in time, I've kept in touch with him and I keep trying to bring him back in and trying to bring him back in, but he feels so betrayed by the church and by the pastors and by people who would seemingly have been there to lift him up, to edify him in the truth of what should, should have been done. Uh, that he doesn't want to attend. So I talked to him again, and, and he was stating what a mess the world was in right now and how he felt absolutely powerless and hopeless and, and confused as to why things aren't, you know, common sense has just been thrown out and they're just seeming to do whatever agenda fits the needs of the day. And I said, well, you know, that's why we're meant to be in community with one another able to hold each other up to the truth, to take us out of that state of confusion. See, if we band together and we bond together as the family of God, then we're able to affect change within our communities. As our communities change, then the nation changes. And hopefully the climate that we live in with the news and with everything else could possibly change as well. But see, it all starts with us. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. It all begins with us. So I said, you need to be in community in order to affect that change. And he truly, he stood there and he stared at me and he goes, I can't argue with you. I said, good, don't, just come. So I'm hoping it'll be that little nugget that'll just kind of seed that'll grow within him and hopefully he'll be able to come back in. So my point here is sometimes we make choices in our lives out of anger and not out of wisdom. We don't step back and take a, another look at it and think about what's going on. We don't go to God and ask, God, what should we do in this situation? We act out of anger. And then we become stuck and we're leading a life that is filled with bad, with the consequences of our bad decisions into an unfulfilled life and away from what God's intended purpose is for us in our lives. And sometimes we become victims of circumstance and become confused on the correct action to take. So as I was writing all this this week, and I, was, I, I stopped and prayed for him and his family probably about three or four times. And I think we, we need to do that within our communities as, is pray for those, and, and we do, we've got a list of people who have fallen away that we want to see back into that relationship with God. But we have to expand it further into those that we don't even know of, that are struggling through these things, that, that were trapped or confused and made bad decisions so they can get back on course, get back to the life that God intended for them. Because as you see, when he was working with that before, he was changing lives of kids, great numbers of kids. I mean, 
his youth group was over 60 people. They, they actually started a daycare in their church because these people wanted their kids to grow up in that kind of atmosphere. And that's all going away. It's all gone away. The wisdom of God equips us and prepares us for us to do God's purpose. It strengthens us so we become victors over confusion and not victims of so we can overcome the falsehoods and uncertainty with the God-given confidence that comes through knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. Having the Holy Spirit living within us to help guard us against all of these things, these falsehoods that would tend to confuse us. Wisdom, see, is often confused with knowledge. But there's a huge difference. And we talked about this the other day. It, you know, you can know the scriptures, and, but if you don't understand them, if you don't gain the wisdom from them, it's just simply knowledge. Demons know the scriptures, but they don't have the wisdom of God working within them. Knowledge involves an accumulation of facts, and wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge and achieve the best outcome. Someone once said that wisdom is knowledge that is using its head. And I thought that was really, really apropos. Knowledge is knowing what a tomato is, that it's a fruit and not a vegetable. But see, wisdom is knowing not to put that tomato into an apple pie. So knowledge and wisdom are two different things. And really it comes down to how do you apply what you know? How do you apply what you know? And so if we know God, how do we apply it to our lives? And that's the wisdom of God. And that's what we're talking about today. In my last sermon, I talked a little bit about conscience and our, and our consciousness, and what we're talking about in there, and this sense of conscience that we have, which is loosely defined as an inner feeling or voice, which we can view as acting to guide us through rightness or wrongness of our behavior. So this spirit of conscience that we have within us is a guide to help us make wise decisions. So our conscience is reacting to learned behavior formed from prior precedents. And I talked about that in the sermon that, you know, from the point in time that we are a little child, we learn things as we go. And in other words, we, we learn from precedents that were set by things that we experience, we learn from those things, and if we're wise, we don't make the same mistakes twice. So in other words, we learn the difference between right and wrong by the things that we have been, that we have done in our past, and our conscience help guides us from making the same or similar mistakes. Now wisdom is knowing to do the right thing without a precedent. A precedent. So if we're standing at the edge of a cliff with a 500 foot drop off and not jumping off is wisdom in action. Meaning we didn't have to do this before to know it wouldn't turn out well for us should we jump. So wisdom is able to know and understand a given situation. That's, and that is basically based upon our past knowledge. The only problem with these are when deception then creeps in. Falsehoods. Even then, the best of our intentions can go awry. And we have to understand that. So we always have to be on guard. We have to have that, what they call in here in, in our study that we're going through, is that helmet of wisdom to help guard ourselves from letting all the junk come in and confuse us and mislead us and having us make wrong decisions. We need to protect our minds from deception and confusion. We need wisdom from God. That means we need to take the concept of wisdom even further because it's not enough for us to only have only wisdom that the world offers. In Scripture, wisdom refers to the knowing the course of action that will please God and make our life what He wants it to be. And see, that goes back to that instance I was talking about with Him with the youth group. He was doing what God wanted, and it was pleasing to God, and God was helping it grow. But 
then he made a decision that led to consequences that separated him from God's will in his life. So, Scripture refers to knowing the course of action that will please God and make our life what he wants it to be. When God promises us wisdom, he promises a way of life superior to the way of the world. Superior to the way of the world. He guarantees us that through this gift of wisdom, you and I will find good and acceptable, perfect ways of walking with God. Wisdom is acquired through our efforts to learn, <clears throat> joining together in groups and study, reading the Word of God, going through devotions, uh, taking your daily devotions. You know, I like to listen to other uh, pastors as they're giving messages because pastors need to get fed too. But one of the things I tell you, and I was talking to Pastor Terry about this this morning, early before we get in here, it gives us a little bit of time to go through and talk about things. And I was listening to Pastor Robert Morris, uh, and he was talking about uh, the dominion. And he had a, a six-sermon series on, on knowing the truth and, and knowing the truth of the Bible and applying it in our lives. And he talked about the dominion of God and how when Adam and Eve were were in the Garden of Eden, God gave them dominion over all of the creatures and all of the trees and over all of the earth. And when they sinned, they handed that dominion over to Satan. And Satan got the dominion. And he goes through all these things in Scripture and pointed out all these incidents and how we actually got the dominion back by Jesus' death on the cross. We don't have to worry about that dominion and when Satan was tempting Jesus and said, I'll give you dominion over all these things, well, guess what? He didn't have that dominion to give. It had already been given back to us through Christ. So knowing the truth of the scriptures, knowing, getting our wisdom from the scriptures, knowing what God has for us in there is very, very important for us to live a complete and fulfilled life. Through Christ. So our efforts to grow and to study, it's, it's, doesn't just come automatic to us. It has to be learned. It has to be done over time. It's not instantaneous. And they say there's a reason that gray-haired guys have more wisdom. And I'm truly sorry to say it's not about the hair or the lack of it. It's about the years because you have to accumulate wisdom over time. It just isn't a, in a flash and get it. And see, we have to understand that it's all about practice. We have to practice wisdom. We have to practice uh, what we're given in here or we lose it. And it's also about perspective. There's another misunderstanding about what the gift of really is and how we apply it to our lives. And in a book by J.L. Packer is called Knowing God. He uses this metaphor to help us understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. He said, just imagine for a moment that you're in a train station and you're standing on the end of the platform and you're watching that constant movement of the trains coming in and going out. And from this limited perspective that we have, your vision and comprehension of the overall workings of the train system at that point in time is almost non-existent. All you know is that trains come and go because your perspective is so limited at that point in time. However, however, now imagine if you go into that station's control center and there's this long electronic chart on the wall. And on that chart on the wall, it shows all the tracks extending for five miles on either side of the station. And by following those little lights that move along the path, you know exactly where each train is headed. And as you watch that system through the eyes of the men who control it, you understand then why the trains are stopped and why they're started and why they're diverted, why they're sidetracked. And the logic become, behind every one of those movements that they're doing becomes very clear to you when you see the entire 
picture. Wisdom is seeing beyond the incidental, beyond just what's in front of you. It's seeing more of the entire picture. And the mistake that many Christians make when they're seeking wisdom as soon as they think, as soon as we find it, it's going to show us everything there is to know about life from inside the control center instead of just from that platform. I've heard it described before as this is getting God's perceptive perspective of our world. But see, that's not how that works in Christian life today. We're not shown the overall pattern of the universe or how we fit into it or where we're going to end up. That isn't shown to us. We're not shown God's long-term plan for us or how our actions today will plan, work into that plan for tomorrow. But see, as we grow in God's Word, as we grow in our relationship with God, He reveals more and more of the truths of the Scriptures, more and more of the plan that He has for our life. He reveals that as our relationship with Him grows. So see, it's not instantaneous. It is a boom, we give our lives to the Lord and now we have all of our Christian perspective. We have to gain it through knowledge, through study, through devotions, through communion with each other. And if we drop out one portion of that along the way, and we drop out study, or we drop out devotions, or we drop out our church life together, then we're going to be missing out on part of that plan Part of that vision that God has for us as Christians today. James 1, 2 through 8 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish his work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such as a person is double-minded and unstable in so that's the same thing as our call to worship today, but I found this other translation and I said, wow, this really speaks to it. But I wanted you to hear both. Because see, these speak to people differently depending upon how God reveals it to our hearts. Depending upon where we are in our walk with God. So when we think about that, let perseverance finish its work, which means don't just start on something and drop it. Don't do things part way. But if God says, you have the opportunity to learn here and do these things and participate with others here, then you're to do it so, so that God can finish his work and reveal all those truths to you. If we drop out, we're missing part of it. And we don't want to miss out. This is telling us that though we may not know the whole picture of what God has for us, we need to walk by faith. And not doubt. And God will give us the wisdom to make the proper choices in our life. In James 3, he goes on to tell us more about the wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility, that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitterness, envy, self-ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So I talked about that when we started out about this intentional confusion and spin that's put before us each and every day and how if we study God's word, it tells us how to tell the good from the bad. How to be in communion with each other to help us through those bad times. To help us clarify and discern what the truth is. 
to be in study, to learn the things in God's Word. See, this sermon is all based on the study that we go through on Wednesday night. And it's all done to help us overcome all of the things that we face in life today. It's called the Overcomer Series for a good reason. But we have to participate. We have to persevere through it. We have to hear and understand what God wants for us in the life, or we're only getting a piece of the picture at a time. And therefore, we won't have that entire plan and perspective for our lives. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submission, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So we're, we're contrasting those who give that, that opinion of the world and, and they seek to spin things and confuse people and lead them away from that life of righteousness. And it tells us in here, but the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that comes from heaven, from his word, gives us all these things, the purest of spirits. It gives us the fruits of the spirits, if you notice what it was saying in there. And it helps us persevere through those rough spots that we face in our lives. See, we're gonna face the rough spots regardless of how we overcome those is by having this wisdom from God that helps take those rough spots from being peaks and valleys and kind of levels out the playing field a bit. Doesn't mean we won't face them, but we'll understand that as we face them, we don't face them alone. We face them in concert with those around us, with our believers, with our church. So what it tells us is the wisdom of the world is not wise, but tainted in contrast to the wisdom of God, which is from heaven and perfect in every way and doesn't condemn and is righteous. So that you may ask, how do we obtain? Dr. Jeremiah gives us six things we need to do based on God's Word. And by the way, if you ever want it, we've got sermon notes right up in here so you can kind of scratch these things down. Because these are good points. So number one, it says, we need to have a devo devoted mind. And in Matthew 22, 37, it says, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Number two says, you have to have a dedicated mind. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things before, because we have the mind of Christ. Number three, have a disciplined mind. 1 Peter 1.13, so think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Number four, have a determined mind. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. Number five, have a diligent mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them instead to obey Christ. And number six, have a developing mind. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing. So if we think about these things, we think about these six points, how do we keep from getting confused by the spin of the day, by the fake news? Well, these six points tells us to keep our mind trained on the Word of God, on the truth that God has for us. Keep ourselves trained, keep ourselves in communion with other believers, that community that we build. Dr. Jeremiah says our ability to acquire God's wisdom is not so much a matter of doing as a matter of being. And I like that. 
It's not a matter of doing as it is a matter of being. So we can just go about the works and we can busy ourselves up. And if you ever notice, there's a lot of people who, who are just busy in their life. And they're always busy doing something and they think that makes them look really good because they're doing stuff. But see, who are they really? Who, what is their being? Where are they focused? Who are they chasing after? What is their purpose that they're trying to achieve by being busy all the time? So our ability to acquire God's wisdom is not so much a matter of doing, just simply going through the motions, but it's a matter of being, living in God's word, receiving the word of God into us, and living it out daily. so much doing but being. We have to prepare the ground of our minds so the seeds of God's wisdom can take root. We will strengthen our faith and protect our minds when we choose to put that helmet of salvation on to overcome confusion with God's wisdom and clarity. So when we feel like we're confused or being spun by the world, we need to remember that we have a community of believers here to support us and lift us up above the fray of the world that will be treated not as the world treats us, but with grace and with understanding. We need to learn to lean on each other, not only for our own understanding and to take of God in prayer, so that we don't make the hasty decisions and come to wrong conclusions. Be the community that God has called us out of the world we don't have to worry about overcoming the world because what did Christ say? The scripture tells us that be of great joy because I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, help us to take your word and your message today into our hearts and to live it out fully each and every day. To understand, Lord, that you need to be at the center of that we need to fully participate in your word through all of our actions in our lives. Lord, help us to be in community with each other, to lift each other up in love and in your spirit, and help us to go into this community and live it out so others may come to know your great and glorious works. In your precious and holy name. just tied up so nice and neatly in those final six points. But I feel like I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to the first part of it because there's so much truth in the words that Mark gave us today. It, you know, those final ones he talked about, the devoted mind and the, the dedicated mind, the disciplined mind, the determined mind, the diligent mind, and the developing mind. All these things about loving God having that mind of Christ and thinking clearly. That's the one that stuck really well, because when you look out in the world, the people don't think clearly. They're, they're, they get focused on things and then they get pulled away because they don't have the self-control that the scriptures can give us because they're focused on things that are of the earth and not of God. And they're not obeying Christ. And in obeying Christ, we have a renewing of the minds. These are practical things that we can do in the midst of what is going on in the world right now. God gives us those tools. In asking for wisdom to overcome confusion, we become like Christ. And when we ask for wisdom, we need to trust that God will give it to us. And all this ties back to what His Son, Jesus, did for us on the cross. That's why on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And then 
the same way after the meal, he took the cup and he filled it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us that as often as we do this, we are to do so until Christ returns. And I can think of so many times where we say, come Lord, come. Jesus, come. Just come now. But here's the thing, God has more wisdom than we do, and he knows who that last person will be to accept him, and he is waiting patiently. So he's teaching us some patience in and of that. Father, you provided for us an amazing message this morning on what we can do in the coming days, weeks, months, and years to overcome, to overcome <coughs> that confusion that the world throws at us, Father. <coughs> Let us come to you seeking wisdom just as Solomon did. And Father, I can speak for myself. I don't need all those other things that you gave Solomon. Yes, they would be nice, but I just want wisdom. Wisdom on how to take care of my family, how to love my family and friends better, like Christ did. Help me to love your church. And more, most important, Father, help me to love all your children, regardless of whether they know you or not, so that through my actions and, and the words that I say, and I will be Christ-like, and they will want that. And they will be drawn to you. Thank you, Father, for your message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. And, um, Anybody have any prayers or, or God sightings this week they'd like to, to share? I'm going to pray for Lori. Yes, we'll pray for Lori. She had a great surgery and her knee is healing. And we'll just continue to pray for her. And God is so good. And uh, I uh, uh, went to the Christian bookstore this week and last week. And <laughs> I made a friend there. And, and um so I found this book of prayers, 100 Favorite Bible Prayers, and um, God is so good, and it, it's just wonderful to actually open the book and find something that, that you're needing prayer for, and it's right there. So, because um, prayer doesn't, you know, God doesn't heal through me, but he heals through the group of believers and through his word, and as we come together and pray together, you know, he will heal. And I found something this week I thought was worthy of speaking about, and it's uh, Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Lord, only you know what I truly need today. Only you know what I can handle today. Only you have laid out your perfect plans for my day. May I meet today with wonder and praise. So we thank you, Jesus. Father God, we come to you this morning, and we want to thank you for all things, great and small. Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you to accomplish. So I thank you for Lori Hickson, Lord God. I pray Psalms 34, 7, the angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear you, and you will draw near to them. So, Father God, please deliver her from her pain and her knee and her suffering. Heal her knee completely, Father God, for she loves you and she knows who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for her life. In Jesus' name. And, Father God, be near to those who need healing. By faith, let us be overcomers in Jesus' name. For you have overcome the world. You are God from everlasting to everlasting.
this brings us to the close of our online portion of our service today and we thank those of you who joined us online and those here in person and uh, we pray God's blessings on you today. Let us close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave. And that he paved the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan and that you made a way for us. We confess today our need for you to refresh us and to make us new again. We ask you to renew our hearts and our minds for the days ahead. We pray for your redemption for us. Help us to keep your words of truth planted firm within us. Help us to keep focused on what is pure and right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we have been, sending his lies and attacks our way, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear and removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls that we face each and every day. Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us and through us and over us to be a light to our world. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and purposes and set your way before us. May all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and your healing. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift. To you be the glory and honor on this, our resurrection day, yes. and forever. In Jesus' name.